And welcome once again to The Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And we have a very special bonus episode for you once again. We are joined this time by Steve Mentz. Hello, Steve. Hello, Chris. Hello, Suzanne. Hey, Steve. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my pleasure. So Steve is a professor of English at St. John's University in New York City and is the author and editor of many books, including At the Bottom of Shakespeare's Ocean, Shipwreck Modernity, the essay collection Oceanic New York, and most recently Break Up the Anthropocene. And so as you might guess from those titles, Steve focuses on Shakespeare and early modern literature and on environmental humanities, ecopoetics, and in particular, what he's calling blue or oceanic humanities which is all very exciting and very relevant to these watery oceanic books that we've been talking about lately. But Steve, I wonder if you would start by telling us a little bit about what is Blue Humanities. Yeah, thanks. I'd love to. Um, it's a word that I've been using for, a, I don't know, a little bit more than a decade now, I guess, to just think about the long-term relationship between humans and the sea. I mean, in some ways, it's not like a super new thing. People have been writing about the sea and thinking about the place of the sea in literature for you know a very long time, as you'll see with Homer next episode. But there's a desire, I think, in the present to think about the oceanic environment and the way in which it both sort of structures and puts limits on and entices us away from uh, familiar ideas about the relationship between humans and the land, for example. For me, the environmental angle is important, both because the ocean is, you know, most of our planet, most of our biosphere, and also the place that we can't go to stay, right? It's a it's an environment that is enticing and beautiful, and we want to write poems about it and tell stories about it, but it's also a place that is alien and threatening and, and sort of fundamentally inhospitable. We want to belong in it, but we can't. Exactly. Yeah. We want to be near it. We want to be in it. But we can only do that sort of um, on the margins or, or partially. Yeah. And you're writing, I remember at one point you talk about that being kind of a paradise-like quality, like the sense of being cast out from there, Yeah, which I thought was so evocative. I love that. Yeah. No, it is both, uh, you know, I went for a swim in the ocean this morning and it is both, you know, like I love to be in the ocean for, you know, an hour or two a day. And also you're often reminded of the sort of awkwardness of being a human in an aqueous environment, you know. It is, it is just a place that it's that you can go for a time, but not to stay. There's so much in what you've been opening up around blue humanities, and it touches on some of the issues that have been bubbling up when Chris and I have been talking over the last few episodes. Are we talking about a watery cluster? Are we talking about an oceanic cluster? You know, like where is the ground? What is is it water? Is it ocean? Is it blueness? Um, it's just so interesting to unpack that and think about to sort of disambiguate the different aspects. Um, blue, I think, is a beautifully capacious way of doing it. Yeah, that's one of the things that I think is, is I mean, the, the term blue water is a 19th century, you know, yachtsman's term about sailing out, out of sight of land. So it's a little anachronistic in terms of thinking about Shakespeare's period. But this idea of blue as a color that evokes a kind of alien space, but it's also the, the color of the sky. And in fact, when Shakespeare talks about the sea, he mostly terms it green you know, references to green Neptune. Yeah. And like in the Middle Ages, right, when they use the word blue, it usually, at least in Middle English, it usually means black. Like when they're talking about the color of the sky or the color of water, blue is not the word that shows up at all. Well, and similarly, when we get to Homer next time, it's the wine dark sea. There's no blue at all. So what is the color of the sea, right? And of course, the color of the sea always changes, right? Even when one wants to use something like blue humanities as a capacious term, the sea can be green, the sea can be brown, the sea can be, you know, gray, you know, wine dark, what exactly that color is, is the subject of some debate. Um, you know, it, it is, I mean, partly because, of course, water is to some significant extent transparent right, or translucent, that it changes color in different light. So it's a kind of host for color rather than a, a particular color. Yeah. And, you know, this question is, you know, materiality, you know, like, can we think about materiality with regard to water? I mean, that emerges in some places in your writing um, that we might get to talk about, like in terms of salt and all the things that are in ocean besides water. One of the things that this thought of the different colors at different time periods and different cultures have used for what color the ocean is is making me think that different cultures have had different relationships to the ocean, including ones that we think of as fairly close to ours. Are there noticeable 
ways that Shakespeare thinks of the ocean, which feel very different from how we nowadays tend to think about it. Yeah, I, th- I think so. I mean, one thing that, that I think about a fair amount is the difference between freshwater and saltwater. And the, the, you know, the way in which fresh water is required in some sense for human thriving, um, for agriculture, for, um, you know, sort of for basic health needs. And the salt water, which, of course, you know, there's a lot more salt water on our planet, um, is both a um, extraordinary means of transportation and also this, you know, dangerous and alien space. And, and I think that, I mean, one of the things that historians tell us is that the idea of recreational swimming, you know, the way we effectively relate to the seashore is really not very present yet in the early modern period. Uh, It's really a sort of late 18th, 19th century innovation to go to the beach for pleasure or for therapeutic reasons. So, you know, that that sort of around the turn of the 19th century. And so for Shakespeare, for the early modern poets and writers, the ocean is, I think, more alien and less recreational than it is for us. And so the sense of the sea as a kind of aesthetic lure is is clearly developing in Shakespeare, but there is an argument that it's it's still sort of in an earlier phase and it isn't going to become full fully articulated until, you know, someone like Byron um, or Romanticism. And also there's the distance in time, but then there's also that question of like, the landscape that's, or the seascape or waterscape that's proper to the person. So if we think about Shakespeare as a London-based writer for the most part, right, at least for most of his career, right? It's far away from the seascape, but it's on the Great River, which flows out into the Thames estuary, you know? So the sea is distant and yet proximate, right? And so that's interesting to think. And it's a tidal river, right? So... Yep, exactly. It's a tidal river all the way up past the city, and Shakespeare clearly had contact of some kind with travelers. Um, You know, the whole question of of Shakespeare's own possible travel outside London is is a little bit hard to figure, but it's quite clear that he's reading travel narratives, and he is in contact with members of the Virginia Company. Um, In The Tempest, he seems to be quoting from a manuscript letter written about the wreck of the sea venture on Bermuda in 1609 that was eventually published, but wasn't published until 1622. So, Assuming we're right that he read the letter, which seems pretty likely, you know, he saw it in manuscript circulation rather than in print. So the the sense that London is a city that is home to sailors and voyagers um, seems pretty clearly present in, in Shakespeare's writing um, and seems to have been part of his experience. Yeah, there's that kind of proximity, right? Even yeah. if it's not right there. Mm-hmm. And one of the aspects that we were kind of unpacking there in terms of Shakespeare's sea, especially the sea that we are presented with in The Tempest, on the one hand, it's explicitly a kind of Mediterranean environment because we understand that we're between Italy and the north coast of Africa. But there's a suggestion that we're also kind of in an Atlantic landscape. And we were starting to puzzle that out. Like, is that ambiguity saying something about watery landscapes or waterscapes, whatever we want to call them in general? That is, even though they're specific and local in some sense, are they also all the same? You know, like, how do we talk about that? I found that really hard to sort out. Yeah, I I think that's right, that one of the things that is particularly interesting, both to Shakespeare as an artist, and I think to a lot of people who think and write about the ocean, is that every piece of it is both local and global. You know, when when I walk down the street to my little corner of Long Island Sound and go for a swim, I am swimming in the world ocean, right? It's a connected body that includes the Indian Ocean and the Southern Ocean and the Arctic Sea. Yeah, that's so cool. So there is both a very particular kind of experience in every bay every body of water has its own distinctive qualities um, that sailors need to know, but also it is a global phenomenon. And I think that when when Shakespeare is, you know, clearly setting the tempest in the Mediterranean, but also with these gestures toward Bermuda and toward South America, he's thinking about the world ocean. You know, he's thinking about the, the sort of globalizing impetus of European culture in the 16th and 17th century. That That's, you know, on his mind. And that's also so clearly what the history of the Tempest tells us, right? The Tempest becomes a Caribbean text. It isn't really a Caribbean text, but it's a text that is fascinating to people who are thinking about the Caribbean, especially in the 20th century, so that you get different Caribbean 
poets and writers who are responding to the model of the tempest, a kind of model of colonialism and slavery and, and um, you know, colonial violence uh, that then can maybe be inverted and thrown back, in, you know, into the master's face, as it were, um, by rethinking about what it means to be Caliban, what it means to be Ariel, what it means to be responding to the power of the, you know, the, the white magician. Do you have a favorite such response narrative from the Caribbean? You, you know, there, there are quite a few. And I guess I'm thinking about uh, Césaire's uh, A Tempest, uh, which is the most explicit one. Um, but there are also these gorgeous poems by um, Kamal Brathwaite and also by Derek Walcott. I, um, I quoted a bunch of these in the Shakespeare's Ocean book. And what, what struck me about those is that some of them are very explicit that they're actually naming characters from Shakespeare's plays, but even some that are a little more oblique are um, wonderfully like taking the superstructure of a play like The Tempest and re- and writing back to it or back against it. So um, uh, the other um, writer who's who's super interesting and, and uh, important to me in this regard is um, Edward Glissant, the francophone writer. I mean, he does write specifically with reference to Shakespeare, but it's often a little bit more oblique. It's just a little bit at more of an angle, um, writing about the way in which the the way the world looks from a Caribbean perspective, um, in, in a way that I think is beautifully and productively unsettling of a uh, European perspective. Do those texts often bring in some of the Tempest's interest in a kind of restoring an upset balance uh, as well? Uh, and if so, how how does that play out? Yeah, I mean, I think that in in something like Glissant, in in his poems and in his uh, his sort of criticism on ideas of hybridity and and what he calls relation. I'm not sure that the sort of formal balance and reassertion of hierarchy, which is part of what I take it to be the final move of the Tempest, uh, I'm not sure that that's the direction in which the Caribbean postcolonial writer wants to wants to wrap things up. Like in some ways, he's asking for us to re-see the, a world that doesn't insist on the return of the inheritance of the throat of Naples as the sort of central order giving principle in the world. Instead, I think that the, the alternative, and I think it is an alternative that's present in the Tempest, although it's not the one that Shakespeare sort of endorses in the fifth act, is something more like the opening scene, in which the project is to encounter this oceanic violence and to struggle with it and to you know try to figure out how to make the pieces of the machinery work, both the political machinery and the the maritime machinery, in a way that enables you to stay afloat for a little while. Yeah, that chaotic scene is extraordinary. Um, it's something we were dwelling on a little bit as well and trying to sort out what it's doing there, what its function is, because it's almost like a threshold or something like that. There's something, or a curtain, there's something going on there that um, sets, I was going to say sets the stage, that's a little yeah. heavy-handed, that that, <laughs> that prepares us for something um, entirely different. We we're talking about that in terms of chaos and order, but I don't know if that's sufficient language to describe what's happening there. Yeah, I, I think about it a lot in terms of um, environmental engagement. Like it's a it's a play that's surrounded by the water, but that mostly doesn't go in the water, yeah. um, except for that scene. That scene is is drenched. Yeah, when the water is everywhere, that is, it's tossing around them, and it's in the air, and it's driving at you, and you know, it's it's above and below and everywhere. So they're not quite immersed in the water, but they're almost right. Yeah. I mean, that's mm-hmm. the and that, of course, is terrifying. Terrifying politically, terrifying personally. You know, it it is it is frightening in all these ways, and so the so the arrival of the second scene where where Miranda starts explaining her emotional relationship with the people, you know, she suffers with those that she saw suffered, and then Prospero says, "Oh, don't worry about it. I got it all under control, sweetie. The whole world <laughs> is my theater, and I will arrange it." That's both kind of horrifying, and also like like if the if the first scene is frightening enough, then that's when you need Prospero's tyrannous order. <laughs> His apparently benevolent tyranny, right? Yeah. This is the thing, right? Yeah, semi-benevolent, right? Well, that's the thing, <laughs> right? As you say, it's reassuring in the context of the violence and terror that comes immediately before. But yeah. what is that? You know, what is that as a system to live within? Yeah. 
and Prospero himself, of course, is a is a relatively. I mean, he doesn't kill a lot of people, and unlike you know villains in in any other Shakespeare play we could name. But you know, he likes to make sure that Caliban knows he's going to be pinched and cramped. Well, the threat of violence is always there, isn't it? I mean, that's, exactly. That, that was mm-hmm. that's my sense of it, anyways. That the, even if the violence isn't performed, the imminent threat of violence is always there yeah and that and that the control i mean the you know he's going to put ariel back in the tree he's going to pinch caliban he's going to oh he'll, he'll just put miranda to sleep i suppose but the 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 sense of control like for a long time i thought about prospero as the principle of providence from greek romance because this is one of the plays in which shakespeare's working through this cultural fascination with the the romances of antiquity in a bunch of the late plays and I still think that's right, but he's a particularly grumpy form of providence, right? <laughs> he's like providence, but he's always pissed off. What you just said made me wonder something, which hadn't occurred to me before, but but you might know this. Did audiences in Shakespeare's time, did they think of Prospero as the villain or the hero or something else? Yeah, I don't know that we have a very good sense of how exactly Prospero would have been played. Um, obviously, you know, he's played by the same actor who plays Lear and Macbeth and, and Othello. Um, you know, he's played by Burbage. And, and, and so there's always the possibility that that who also played Richard III, right? He could he could be a tyrant. That actor is good at playing tyrants, but it's unclear. I don't believe that we have any primary evidence about how the play was was understood or even whether it was understood in a unified way, right? I mean, the play was performed at court. The king was interested in plays about magic. <laughs> um, but, you know, Prospero is also not a terribly great example of a, of a good king, right? He's sort of a king who, who falls down on the job and gets displaced by somebody who is smarter and more ruthless than he is. So, so there's a, I mean, it seems to me that there's a, fair amount of ambivalence in the way Prospero is portrayed as a ruler. And I'm not sure how that ambivalence gets resolved. You know, the the great speech that is mostly a quotation from Ovid's Medea. I was just going to ask about that. Yeah. yeah, in which he says goodbye to his magic is also this description of some incredible violence, right? Of uh, environmental violence, raising the dead, you know, pulling the sleepers out of their graves. I mean, he's a monster in that moment. Yeah. I mean, what are we supposed to make of that? Exactly. And, and I always think of that as a deeply troubling moment in the play. Yeah, I, I exactly. Exactly wondering that. Because that is like one of the darkest moments in Golding's Metamorphoses, right? That speech of Medea. And it's beautiful poetry, but it's also absolutely terrifying and unnatural in all kinds of disturbing ways. So what does it mean to have it there in his hands, right? As as a kind of very potent declaration of the nature of his power. Yep. And theoretically the last one, although it's really not quite the last one, because even after he has drowned his book, he claims in the very last scene to be able to promise calm winds and auspicious gales. Calm seas and auspicious gales, I might be misquoting it. So there is this sense that weather magic isn't absolutely gone. Like he can still claim the authority to control the weather, which is the basis of the power. Like that's the first and the last power that he shows in the play. You know, I, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with pre-modern understandings of the weather. Um, but I think this play is also obsessed with them, that the weather environment is both the thing that Prospero uniquely can control and also the thing that is terrifying and unsettling for, for everybody concerned. You know, not just for Antonio, whose brother is out to get him, but for all the Italians who, who end up on the island in this unsettled space. Yeah, absolutely. And that closing moment, as you suggest, right, um, implies that he still has that control, even though he's uh, uh, explicitly says he's given up his power, you know, broken his staff, drowned his book. I'm still going to promise you calm seas. Like, so that, I mean, how seriously do we take the disavowal, right? Is that also a performance? One of the things about that moment that I've been thinking about, and I haven't reread the text closely enough, perhaps, to feel certain about this, but early on, when Ariel is discussing his freedom, and his demands for freedom, Prospero says, oh, you'll be freed in two days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and after all, Ariel is the the force that actually causes the storm, Mm -hmm. that actually performs all this. Is the instrument. Is the instrument, exactly. So 
is that two days meant to give them enough time to have mm-hmm. calm winds to get home? Mm-hmm. That Ariel is still going to have this bond between the two of them? And then what does that mean about the relationship between Prospero and Ariel? Yeah, there's some complicated stuff about time, right? Because he's because Ariel says, if I, if I do this exactly as you want me to, you're going to bait me half a day. I can't, I have to look at the text too. I didn't check the, the I mean, as you guys talked about in your episode, time is a really tricky thing in the tempest it's almost in real time it's um you know one of only two plays that follow the unity of time and it all takes place in the same day along with the comedy of errors and so there is this kind of self-consciousness about temporal progression and yet it also like a lot of the important action happened you know 12 years ago i guess when when they were back in in milan um so so there is this weird both consciousness that time is only the thing we have, you know, in the now, in the present right now, and also that time is this, uh, you know, difficult to manage and understand structure. I was at an art show recently, uh, these uh, graphite pieces by this artist named Via Selmans, who draws, amongst other things, the ocean in graphite. And it's just these very realistic even depictions of the surface of an ocean with all the ripples, but caught in a moment in time. And I've been thinking about that. I, I saw this exhibit a few days ago and and then reading The Tempest and then thinking about this idea of the ocean as something that is almost outside of time, that it's been there for ages and ages, millions and, and billions of years, perhaps even. And yet also it is something that when we encounter it's can be it is very immediate we start with the tempest with the 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 ocean insisting upon the nowness of everything uh, that the characters lives are at stake and i i've been mulling over that idea of, of oceanic time as being both a long a long durée a long period of time and also immediate and also on its own clock, right? The tides, which, you know, through the day and then also through the month, right? There's a, there's also, we haven't, t- we didn't talk about this last time, but the, the, the cycles of time that the water measures on the shore, right? So that, that clock, as it were, is ticking as well. Yeah. Where I swim locally here in Connecticut, it's pretty silty if I go down at low tide. So from about, you know, early June to mid October, I'm, um, very conscious of, of when exactly high tide is. You know, I track it day by day so that I can get my get my high tide swim in. And, you know, that kind of awareness, it's really different in the wintertime when I'm swimming in a pool because um, it's cold. Um, but that awareness of the kind of uh, the cyclical movement of salt water, it's just a reminder of a different pace. You know, if in an agricultural context, you might be more attuned to seasonal changes in ways that, you know, in a modern industrial society, we are less aware of them. But that twice daily tidal cycle is also this powerful other structure separate from human structures. Yeah, it's not just that tidal structure in general, right? Like, I guess maybe swimming, it's it, you feel it mostly at the daily level, right? But if you're doing sailing or other kinds of, you know, work on the water, it's it's also the month, right? Because where the tides are going to be highest and lowest varies according to the time of month, and that affects yep. what's going on with the fish, and that affects what goes on with the boats and all this stuff. And then annually, of course, like you said, that's really important for people who are on the land who are dealing with crops, but also storm seasons, right? Like there's this annual cycle to the weather as well. So that's what I meant by saying you're in automatically at least three different clocks, so to speak anytime you're in the ocean, right? Yeah. You know, is it coming in? Is it going out? Right. And then the seasonal clock, which is also weather related. The time of tempests. Yes. <laughs> and I also imagine, as you were saying before, your your own bodily clock, you know, you are in a, an inviting but inhospitable mm. environment. How and long can of, you stay? Exactly. Yeah. How, how mm-hmm. long do I have here? How much, how much more time can I spend safely in the ocean? Yeah. talked a lot about the tempest which is awesome but i find myself wanting to think more with you about like I mean, your work has been was, was grounded initially in shakespeare studies you're primarily an early modernist but your work is kind of how can I put it? it's not just that it's grown it's almost like you're looking at it from the other end like looking at your early work and looking at more recent work it's almost like you're talking about water and ocean in shakespeare at one point and then you're talking about water and ocean 
and Shakespeare is there. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like it's almost looking at it from the other end of the telescope or something like that. And when you do that, all these other works come into view as well. I wonder if you could talk about that. Like, what is your engagement with the literature of water? Like, what's the point? Where's your point of view? Where are you situated when you think about it? Yeah, I think that the in the in the sort of current work, I am yeah, I definitely am not taking Shakespeare as as an, much of an exclusive start your Shakespeare there, the modern period. Um, that's still a sort of primary area of you know work for me. But um, I actually just finished a book that is a biography of the ocean. Oh wow! So it begins four and a half billion years ago with planetary formation, and it you know goes into the you know into the present. Um, and it's a it's a short book. Um, and a you know non comprehensive book as we say, but what I'm trying to think about in that is what the history of our planet looks like from an oceanic rather than terrestrial perspective, and that's been the sort of defining question for me for a while now. And it started like, what does the tempest look like if we think about the tempest from the perspective of the water, right? Um, from the perspective of uh, you know, the drowned king who's not really drowned, whose eyes aren't really pearls, but who was placed in that liminal position on the bottom of the sea in the beginning of the play. And so how does that enable us just to rethink literary questions, aesthetic questions, environmental questions, you know, questions about historical change? And so, it, yeah, it's it's led me you know, extremely far afield in terms of my chronological range. I mean, I'm interested in, you know, I, I am obsessed with the Odyssey. I am obsessed with Moby Dick. I am interested in sea poetry in many different sort of venues, um, uh, including contemporary sea poetry. There's an incredibly interesting sort of range of poets writing about the water in the present day, you know, which I don't have anything like a comprehensive knowledge of, but I just get so excited when I see new, new sea poetry. Um, but I also was thinking this is to circle back to just something Chris, you said just a minute ago, which is to think about the ocean as a, um, a space, which is, which is sort of historically stable, um, and that's, I mean, that is actually the, the last line of Moby Dick before the epilogue, right? The, the great shroud of the sea rolled on as it rolled 5,000 years ago. So there's both this kind of fantasy that the sea is absolutely, you know, is outside of history in some sense, as it's outside of human control. But of course it's not, because <laughs> not just because now the sea is full of plastic, um, but but also that the sea also has a history. It's not a history on a human scale, but it, you know, the the movement, erosion, circulation, um, you know, the formation uh, of the sea. There's there's some interesting debate among planetary scientists about how the ocean gets here in the first place. Um, but but there is this sense that the sea both provides this this feeling for us of being outside of history, but the sea also has a history. And so writing the history of the ocean strikes me, and, and this is I mean, there are lots of historians who are doing this as well, um, that there is a, a, a powerful way of, of, in some sense, retelling a narrative of, of environmental history with the ocean at the center rather than at the margins that I am uh, both committed to participating in and also really excited to see lots of other people with other kinds of expertise um, moving forward in the, in the present. When you talk about taking that perspective on oceanic history, I'm reminded of the ways in which in some of your other writing, and I think here I'm thinking of shipwreck modernity, you have these couple of interludes where you kind of pull us as readers to the bottom of the sea um, with uh, a reference to the tempest, you know, that um, those are pearls that were his eyes, that, uh, that, that song you were talking about earlier. And then in the other interlude, pulling us up to the top of the masthead in Moby Dick. And, and, and the, the effect of those moves is to kind of put us off balance a little bit, and also to pull us to the bottom of the sea and above the sea. So it's kind of sandwiched between these two perspectives. Like, And, and I'm not putting it very well, but that seems to me to resonate in interesting ways with the histories of the ocean that you're talking about recounting, right? Because it's something that's unknowable and something that's unspeakable, but we have to speak about it and we have to tell stories of it because, you know, I mean, this world is changing. And we and we actually do speak and tell stories of it kind of obsessively, uh, right? That the, the ocean is is massively present in our cultural histories. I mean, you know, from Odysseus forward, um, that there is this sense in which, you know, I mean, there's there's lots and lots of water in Shakespeare's plays, and 
you know, you sort of don't always expect to find it there. And the way in which our existing literary culture can help us understand the long history of our relationship with an inhospitable environment, right? That that in some ways is the is is one of the reasons I think this work is useful today is that as our environment becomes less hospitable, it turns out we actually have narratives. We have historical imaginings about how one lives in an inhospitable environment or or you know how how one suffers and endures in an inhospitable environment. Uh, and those are the, like like that's one of the things that literature is good for, right? Literature is is a a means of helping us make sense of, you know, what it's like to live in the world. Is there any text I wonder that you're thinking on has changed radically over the years as you've been thinking more and more about the ocean in these ways? Something that maybe you've had a long relationship with, but now that you look at it, all new vistas have opened up because of because of this new focus. Well, I mean, I would say it's not a single text, but um, but the poetry of Emily Dickinson hmm. has become for me in a weird way of maritime work. That's so weird. That is an unexpected answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have come to think of Emily Dickinson as one of the great sea poets in the language. Oh, wow. And I didn't really expect that to be true. You know, obviously it's a, I'm, I'm drawing out, you know, maybe a couple, three dozen, maybe poems from her massive compilation, but she's also in these moments, it's pretty clear to me that she's really obsessed with the sea. You know, she's not a sailor, she's not a swimmer, she's not a, a creature of the sea, but she is obsessed with the sea. She she calls it at one point an everything of silver, which is her, her image of the white water on the sand. And she writes so incredibly evocatively about the moment in which human beings sort of trespass onto the edge of the sea. And um, yeah, so I would say that my thinking about Emily Dickinson you know, who when I was a kid and was introduced to her, I was kind of as a garden poet a little bit, right? A poet who writes about about spiders and and and, and beautifully about things on the land. And 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 within the household, right? Right, you know? yes, and yeah. a domestic poet. And I've come to think of her like I actually now think of her in dialogue with, with Melville. Oh wow. Like they're actually both engaging with this powerful um, alien presence in our world, and obviously Melville does it in the excessive way by running away to sea and and actually like putting his body into the into that space for a period of time. And Dickinson d- does it just with you know language and the imagination. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. So that's 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 definitely been a change from the way I once even taught Emily Dickinson when I was first starting to teach poetry. And now I teach her as a sea poet. <laughs> so, so I've just looked up that poem that you referenced, and it's it's short. And everywhere of silver with ropes of sand to keep it from effacing the track called land, which is a really interesting way of thinking about what the relationship between ocean and land is, that it's somehow antagonistic almost, uh, but also that sand is this liminal space that is actively keeping them apart rather than the byproduct of where they meet. Yeah. Yes. Is it land or is it watery space? Yeah. Because that's, you know, the tide changes that, right? Like that goes back and forth, right? Yep. And the sand that's there today is likely to be quite different sand tomorrow, different shapes and different physical sand. You know. And the beach is differently shaped every year, right? Yeah. As we know, right? Every day. Yeah. Ropes of sand as if it's somehow less suing the ocean or less suing the land. Yeah, this makes me think more about, you know, watery experience. You alluded a little bit earlier at different moments to swimming, you're swimming in different places at different times of the year in different locations and so on. I mean, it gives me kind of two questions. One is just sort of a general question, like, how did wateriness creep into your academic work and how did that happen? (laughs) And then the other, which is probably a big question, but the other one is, um, for those of us who feel strongly about water and want to be with it. There are different kinds of experiences. Like for you, it's swimming and you write so evocatively about that experience and what it does to you and what your interior landscape is like when you're in the act in different kinds of swimming environments. I mean, for me, I also love the water. I love being in this environment, but I am a an amphibian creature. Like, I mean, I like to swim and I like to sail, but I love nothing more than just to be in that in-between wet sandy space. Like that, you know, if I walk down to the beach in the evening, I can't not go in the water. I mean, I just... 
I can't not, you know, I mean, it's just irresistible. And so on the one hand, these are just oceanic spaces, but these are very different spaces, you know, very different corporeal experiences and they do very different things to your consciousness. Anyway, so I wonder if you could talk about that for you, like your, your wateriness. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, my wilderness is definitely sort of built around swimming. And uh, even though I write a lot about sailors, um, especially in the early modern period, I, my, my own sort of personal focus is is built through immersion. And uh, I mean, just very quickly, the sort of story of how I managed to connect my personal interest to my academic interest. Um, I wrote a book on early modern adaptations of Greek romance, classical romance, and noticed that there was, if there wasn't one shipwreck, there were three in almost every single text. <laughs> and so I, to, for a second project, I said, why don't I look at this particular sort of trope, um, both in historical and fictional articulations, um, think about what, what, what kind of work it's doing, why it's interesting. And that ended up putting me in touch with a whole series of people who are working on oceanic culture and oceanic history including oceanic environmental history. And so, and sort of that, and that, you know, I sort of feel incredibly lucky that I sort of found a thing that fits my personal passion as well as my professional interests. But I also think like whenever I meet ocean scientists, people who work in maritime law, people who work in oceanic history, like there's almost always some kind of personal connection, right? For, I mean, every marine scientist, I mean, you guys a couple of weeks ago talked about Moby Dick as a kind of either or book. There are people who love it and people who are, are kind of put off by it. Every ocean scientist I've ever met loves Moby Dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, that's a, maybe that's a narrow subset, right? Um, and there is a way in which it kind of is weirdly a work of science or a work about science or the scientific impulse to categorize and to, you know, write the encyclopedia, as you, as you said in that um, lovely piece you published today, um, Suzanne. Um, but, but there is this sense that like moving from narrative romance to shipwreck to immersion in oceanic culture, it, you know, it came both from my academic professional trajectory and also like a way of sort of bringing my own personal obsession into play. Um, and that's also one of the reasons I write things like the vignettes that you mentioned in Shipwreck Modernity, and I have other kind of similar ones in, in At the Bottom of Shakespeare's Ocean, is is it sort of asking and, you know, feeling fortunate that I've had editors and presses who've been willing to let me entertain the idea that the kind of work we do as academics doesn't just have to be, you know, the sort of drier meaning of what the word research could sometimes connote. Like we can actually be generating ideas and narratives and engagements through the imagination as well as through the the archive. Um, and in fact, that encountering the archive is always a work of the imagination and we can admit that and and embrace that. Yeah. I think you do that also really interestingly in the volume you edited, um, Oceanic New York, where it's also pushing boundaries in different kinds of ways, but here bringing together different contributors. And one of the things that um, really struck me about it is the ways in which it's kind of anchored in this intensely local way, right? Like you said earlier, that ocean is always global and local. And that was a book that does a really good job of saying, you know, acknowledging the global and saying, well, what does it look like right here? And not just right here, but in various kind of case studies, various individual oceanic locations, right? And I found that really compelling. And I had this really neat little kind of like frisson recognition because one of the places you talk about is College Point in Queens. Yep. And my grandfather grew up there. He was born in 1905. He was a German immigrant, lived in in College Point as a little boy. And then when World War I broke out, he had to go back um, to Germany with his father. But he used to talk about swimming in the river. Yep. And it was, I guess it was pretty clean, you know, in the yeah. 19 teens, right? Um, and he talked about that really evocatively. And I remember being really kind of um, enchanted by that, thinking about like, what, what was that waterscape like? Anyway, so when I saw that at the opening book, I was like, oh, wow. It's like a sense of recognition. Yeah, that, that was from, a, um, I have a colleague, Elizabeth Albert, um, who's a painter and an art historian, who did an exhibition um, called Silent Beaches, Untold Stories about the history of the New York waterfront. And she unearthed some pictures of people swimming, maybe your grandfather swimming in College Point and other places in the early part of the 20th century, um, which were amazing and beautiful. And also there's this really, you know, active body of artists who are, you know, performance and installation artists who are working around New York's waterscapes right now. 
And it's so exciting. I mean, it's just an amazing uh, kind of set of, uh, I mean, writers and sculptors and painters and other kinds of, uh, you know, one artist project is to build a bridge across Buttermilk Channel, you know, in New York Harbor, which maybe won't happen because it's caught up in bureaucracy and city struggles, but it's this amazing sort of vision in a city that for a long time was, you know, a, a deeply maritime city. I mean, the downtown New York was sort of home to sailors for much of its history, but that in the 20th century really turned its back on that history, right? And sort of replaced sailors bars with skyscrapers and, and the financial district. And so there's this weird way in which New York City and New York as a community is kind of remembering its own oceanic history. Yeah, well, the Brooklyn Navy Yard was right across yes. the river, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. my yeah. father was born there because his dad was in the Navy. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, and it's like that that whole world has almost been effaced, right? That whole history is almost invisible. Yes. But maybe coming back. I mean, I think mm. this is like in, in destructive ways, as we saw with Hurricane Sandy, um, but also in, I mean, more hopeful and evocative ways. And, you know, there's a lot of effort right now to clean up some of the Queen's waterways, which are so incredibly toxic and difficult having to do with industrial spills, but to sort of bring back into a kind of community the relationship between ocean and city. Yeah. And coming to meet the water, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think that's so profound. Well, thank you for coming in and telling your your oceanic tales with us. Well, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been such an interesting conversation. We could talk for a longer time. I hope we do it again. I hope we do. Excellent. Well, we will be putting links to where you can read some of Steve's writing and get in touch with him. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter, and we'd love to hear from you. And you'll find show notes with links for anything we've mentioned in this episode at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 14B. The Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. But until next time... Until next time, we'll see you again at the Spouter Inn.